Hello and welcome to the Viva podcast with me, Izzy. Today I am joined by Ed Winters, better known as Earthling Ed. He has just released a brand new book, How to Argue with a Meat Eater and Win Every Time. This is his second book. His first book, This is Vegan Propaganda, was a bestseller and a fantastic read. If anyone hasn't read it, go to Allstone and buy yourself a copy. I'd be speaking to him about his animal advocacy, his style of activism, as well as all of his other business ventures. He's founded The Surge Sanctuary, um, two restaurants, Unity Diner in London and No Catch Co in Brighton, as well as a clothing light called Idea, which is I Don't Eat Animals. We'll be chatting to him about all of these issues, as well as the politics of veganism. Welcome, Ed. Um, really lovely to have you here in Bristol and on the podcast as well. Um, obviously, you've just released your brand new book, um, so we're here to talk about your book and everything. Um, but I also wanted to talk about you and what you've done in your um, nine years of veganism. That's right. Yeah. Nine years. Yeah. Um, so let's start from the beginning. How did you get into veganism and how did you get into activism and how are you earthling it now? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, it's funny. I guess, I guess in many ways my story isn't necessarily um, all that strange. I, I was raised in a family where veganism is uh, still sadly not, not that normal. Um, I think they look at me and, and get confused about what happened to me. You know, I left home, came to London and then came back and all of a sudden, you know, I'm this different person. I think they are probably still trying to work that out nine years on. But for me, I was raised in a family where veganism wasn't normal. But then when I left home, I moved down to university. I met people who were vegetarian, started to think about things a little bit differently. You know, my, my, um, my worldview opened up as, as it so often does when people leave home, of course. Um, and then one day in 2014 in May, I came across this story. I was reading the BBC and the story is about this truck and it was uh, driving to a slaughterhouse near Manchester and it had crashed and on the truck were about six and a half thousand chickens. So I'm reading this, this online piece and I'm reading about these birds who've been killed, who are suffering, who've been mutilated, who are in a really terrible state, obviously. And I did this thing I've never done be before. I, I empathize with chickens. Mm -hmm. I'd spent my whole life never thinking about chickens, let alone empathizing with them. And all of a sudden I'm feeling bad for them, thinking, my goodness, how horrible this is for them. But then in my fridge was the remains of a KFC because when I used to eat animals, fried chicken was, was my favorite, followed very closely by um, a piece of steak. So I got leftover KFC in my fridge from the evening before. I'm reading this story, feeling sorry for chickens, and it, it kind of dawns on me in that moment that there's something really wrong here. You know, my values and my, my morals are, are not in alignment with my actions. You know, who am I to feel sorry for chickens when the reason they're going to a slaughterhouse is because people like me enjoy consuming them. And that's a huge disconnect. So I went vegetarian um, May 2014. Didn't really know anything about dairy or eggs. Thought vegetarianism was like doing the bit, you know, that doing the most. And I remember being a vegetarian and thinking that vegans were militant, weird, I thought they had no sense of humor. I thought they liked to be in the center of attention. I just thought these vegans, you know, take, take a chill pill. You know what I mean? I'm vegetarian, I'm doing, doing enough here. Like, just leave me alone. But then um, I saw a documentary called Earthlings. And it was through watching this documentary that my view around this problem obviously broadened even further. And what's interesting about the film What's interesting about this issue generally, of course, is that it's not necessarily about meat, dairy, and eggs. You know, food is a symptom of the problem. The problem is our, our mentality, our mindset. We've devalued non-human animals to such an extent that exploiting and harming them for meat, dairy, and eggs becomes something we view as morally permissible. So they're a symptom of this wider problem, this, this speciesist, um, oppressive way of viewing non-human animals. So the documentary finishes and I am distraught, um, confused, really uh, scared in, in many ways of, of, of what I was coming to terms with. And at the time I had a little hamster. Now I wasn't raised with any pets, no dogs, no cats, mm -hmm. no rabbits. But when, um, when I was at university, I got a hamster, my first ever companion animal called Rupert. And I liked Rupert dearly. He was a sweet little hamster. He was so sassy, so sassy. Such a little personality about him. He was very independent and he had a very strong set of likes and dislikes. And one of the things that Rupert loved was broccoli. Loved broccoli. So when the film had finished, I, I thought, I'll go spend some time with Rupert and, you know, think about this. And I thought, I'll give him some broccoli. That'll cheer me up. You know, a little hamster with, with little paws chewing away. There's nothing nicer. So I give him some broccoli. He's sat there. He's eating it. I'm watching him. And I just think about it and I'm just going, hmm, you know, Rupert the hamster. Such a strong personality. And he's just this tiny little hamster. You know, his world is 
the four walls of my apartment. That, that's his world, my little studio apartment. That, that was his world, right? And he has so much about him that makes him morally valuable. And I would hate it if someone came and hurt him, would, would try to protect him. Yeah, I'm doing far worse to animals. Even as a vegetarian, I'm doing far worse to animals. And my mentality is oppressing animals through this normalization of, of this, this way of thinking about them. And then I really started to think, hang on a minute, you know, this, this, is, this isn't what I first thought it was. So I became vegan. And then after about nine months of being vegan, I um, started to get this other feeling coming over me, which was, <clears throat> It's good to make a change and to embody something yourself, but there's an issue here and maybe this issue warrants a little bit more attention than just me privately, you know, going about my daily business and I'm not thinking too much else about anyone else. And I realized that actually, I suppose there comes a point where there's a certain responsibility to start speaking up about certain things, you know, you know, when, when you have the space and platform and such, you know, it's the opportunity, I should say, to be able to do so. And I went to this vegan event in London and there were vegan YouTubers, vegan um, organizations, vegan campaigners, you know, lots of people from this vegan world. That, and it was my first real introduction into the wider community. And I left feeling really inspired about that. I'd been watching some vegan YouTubers on, on YouTube at the time, um, many of whom have gone off to do amazing things now, um, such as Ali Tabrizi, who's made Seaspiracy. I remember watching him when he was a YouTuber called The, the Friendly Activist, I believe his name was. So there was, there was this, this moment of thinking, hang on, what can I bring to the table? And I, I'd been studying film, I had a camera, I knew how to edit videos, and, and YouTube seemed like a, a, a nice um, natural progression. So I, you know, one day put the camera on the tripod, pressed record, and filmed this terrible video where I'm sat on my sofa and my hands are all clammy and I'm sweating. I'm going, hello, my name's Ed, welcome to my channel. And um, that video never saw the light of day. I, I, I reviewed it and was like, not a chance. But I just kept going and, and building my confidence. And then from there it became um, uh, public speaking um, and, and just really broadened out from there really. So long story short, just these big pivotal moments really and this continuing, progression in my way of thinking about this issue from someone who's very much not interested to becoming more and more interested to becoming very much engaged with the advocacy side as well. Yeah, that's, I mean, I feel like a lot of people have similar, like yeah. either even one of those or many of those issues um, have happened to them. Like I know for myself, like I was raised in, my, my dad's South American, so raised in a very meat heavy family, like Milanesas and like all right. that kind of stuff and like that kind of vibe. And like, I think when I then started saying, well, I don't want to eat a chicken because at five or six, very young, and my parents being like, well, this is what we do. Yeah. <laughs> and like that, like normalization of something because it's societally, society has said it's okay, yeah. is very strange actually, um, when you look back at how children react. Um, when you speak to children, obviously they're so empathetic about animals. <laughs> Um, yeah, and like companion animals is something that you hear consistently about people's vegan journeys. Um, so that's that's very true. I've got a habit called Nancy. Oh, really? Right, little character nice. too. <laughs> yeah, they are sassy. They are they? so sassy. Yeah, yeah it's great. Um, what I wanted to talk about is the students because you do a lot of work with students. You've just you interview a lot of st uh, students on campus and around the streets and stuff. I really do feel like they are the future. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about what you've done with them, because I know you've done lectures with them as well, and I wondered if you could just chat about students. Well, I think students, I, I think there's, yeah, as you say, obviously they um, are, are becoming part of society, um, finding out who they are, what careers they want to pursue. It's this really exciting moment in, in, in your life, you know, whether you become a student or just at that point in your life where you start to really find out more about yourself. It's really, it's a really exciting point. And I think for me, that was obviously a big part of my transition. So I think there's two, well, a number of reasons why I love interacting with students in that sense. Firstly, because I think students have this natural curiosity. You know, they've gone to university to learn, to challenge beliefs, hopefully, to, you know, to consider things in different ways. So I think there's an appetite, um, pardon the pun, for something like this to be discussed. Um, and also, I think that students are, are, are generally more receptive. You know, we're, we're younger at that age, obviously. Um, we are, have probably just left home move into an exciting new place, you're starting to think about things differently. So I like that aspect of it. And I think students have a, more of an inclination towards debate. You know, I think that they're, hopefully the way universities operate is that they kind of invite those kind of informal, informal kind of discussions and debates around them. And I think the UK and the US, a lot of um, sort of educational establishments have a long history of, of kind of debate. And I think that's really important. So I think that I, I, I like targeting students for those reasons. And generally, you know, they, they're quite open-minded, obviously. Um, 
polite, respectful, all the things that you know you, you want from someone who you're talking about these issues with. So yeah, I think students are a, a very good a good place to start when it comes to advocacy and um, the public speaking I really enjoy very much. I think there's a really nice thing about connecting with people in that way. You know, having an audience in front of you, you can look in their eyes, you can get a gauge for how they're reacting. And it's also a really good test for, for you as a speaker to go, right, okay, what's working here? What's not working? Am I losing them? Are they getting more interested now? And just, I find this kind of, it's almost, it sounds a bit pretentious in a way, but there's this kind of, it's, it's not a, a dance, but this idea of like, how do you engage? How do you keep their enge you know, keep them focused, keep them engaged? What are they responding to? Can I go a little bit deeper here? Can I become a little bit more, um, you know, front-footed in this way? Will they respond well to that? And it's fascinating to go to different places and, and see different audience reactions and see, oh, maybe I went a little bit too far then, or maybe I can go a little bit further here. And I just love that kind of expressive aspect of it. Um, so yes, I like that. Yeah. I think public speaking is something I'm definitely getting more into as well, like as an individual, but it's so interesting because you're right. Sometimes you feel like you've done a banger of a speech and you're like, oh. Yeah, right, yeah, so now you just <laughs> um, glazed yeah, eyes you're like, oh no, yeah. I lost everyone. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they're really great and like you are so surprised and I think it's really important to you it, like you talk so much about language and body language and reading individuals as individuals rather than like a you know a 56 year old man or whatever and I think that's something that's so important that's something you talk about in your book a lot I don't know if you feel like that is at the center of activism almost like talking about language and body language I, I think um, absolutely especially in the activism that um, I do and, and that you do as well I think if we're having these interpersonal experiences, these, um, I think quite vulnerable experiences. And I, I always think that when someone sits down and, and speaks with me, um, I should feel very humbled and grateful for that because for someone to come and sit down and be vulnerable um, and express themselves and be you know, willing to have their views challenged, it requires a sense of humility. And I, I have a, a, a huge amount of respect for anyone that does that. And also, I think there's something really um, special you know, I go to a college campus in Texas, for example. Um, it could be in a, in a kind of more rural area in Texas, and this person sits down, and we're gonna spend 20 to 25 minutes together, let's say. The chances are I am never going to see that person ever again, right? This is the only time that we'll share together. Um, and I found that really um, exciting because how often do we get a chance to meet with someone? Um, have this kind of like, this, this conversation which we know this is the only thing we're probably ever gonna share, you know, physically in, in existence and be able to talk about something so important. I find that so exciting. Like I feel so privileged to be able to do that and, and to go to these different areas, places I would never normally go, places that admittedly I don't really like necessarily culturally, but um, to share these experiences with people who I would never normally interact with. And I think we can get very much caught in echo chambers and, and in bubbles where we find our tribe, we find our online space and we integrate into that and have that reinforced to us. And that's great, you know, community is so important. But um, there's something nice about being taken outside of that, even if it is uncomfortable at times, and interacts with people who, who maybe have different views. It makes, makes me a more well-rounded activist as well. But with, with that kind of dynamic that I'm creating, because people are sitting down, they're putting a sense of trust in me to not be horrible to them, to not make them feel bad, to not ruin their day, to not belittle them, to not judge them in a, you know, in a negative way as such. So there, there becomes a responsibility for me to be a good human being, which is to treat people with respect, to respect their time and, and their presence. And also um, there's accountability on me to represent the cause that I'm there to represent effectively. So I have to be mindful of my language, mindful of how I present myself, because if, if I'm not mindful of those things, I can inadvertently go against the very foundations of what I'm trying to represent and push that person further away. In which case, it would be better if I wasn't there than there. Mm -hmm. And if I ever feel like I've sat down or done something and me being there was more harmful than if I had not been there, then I failed terribly. So language is so important because it can be inclusive, it can bring people on board and it can challenge people. You know, when we think about being respectful and, and compassionate and empathetic, that doesn't mean that we then condone what everyone does. It doesn't mean we give people a free pass. Actually creating a more um, healthy dynamic allows us to be, the, to be extra investigative. It allows us to take the next step. It allows us to question people further because we've, we've, we've allowed them to feel like they have the respect to be able to answer honestly and know that what answer they give is not going to be met with something that they may be fearful of, you know? And I think that's what's great about that. So language, body language is so important, especially when we're talking about conversation, public speaking, these, these kind of more intimate environments. Yeah, I always feel like, you know, when you talk to someone on the street and they already are like, 
you know, they feel attacked already with before you've even spoken to them because there's a screen there, you know, if you do like Earthlings experience, you know, you've got the screen there, like they feel uncomfortable, you know, and then that conversation is already kind of on the back foot and you, it's your job to make them feel comfortable and make them open yeah, up absolutely. and make them feel like, no, this isn't an attack on your choices. Right. This is a conversation for, you know, I always think activism, you say seeds, I always think activism is like drops in a glass and you could be the first drop or the last drop or halfway through. Very nice. And, you know, I always think, you know, like you say, end a conversation positively, even if it, you know, you've not agreed. Right. <laughs> it's super important to just do that. It is. And another thing is people, when we have conversations, it's really rare that we'll remember everything that someone said. Mm. You know, I speak a little bit about this in the book. You know, you might have an argument or a debate with someone and you might argue or even have a conversation, it could be 40, 45 minutes. Or say you spend a day with your friend, you spend a whole day, you meet up in the morning, all the way into the evening, you've spent 12 hours together. You're not going to remember every joke that was made, everything you laughed out, every fun thing that happened. But what you will remember is how it made you feel. I had a nice day. I found that person funny. We had a good time. We laughed a lot. And even if you don't remember all of the things that created that laughter, you remember that there was laughter. And so it gives you that sense of warmth and happiness. I'd love to do that again because I loved that, that feeling. So even when we have an argument or a debate with someone, how we leave them feeling can actually be one of the biggest factors in determining how they then process what's happened. Because if they meet a vegan and that vegan is maybe saying all the right things, you know, maybe the facts are there, they're making good arguments, but they're presenting themselves in a very negative way, they're making the other person feel bad. So the information might be correct, but the delivery might be terrible. That person is probably going to leave feeling, that didn't make me feel very good. I feel bad, I feel angry, I feel resentful. And they're not gonna necessarily remember the facts that you gave them, the numbers that you gave them, or even some of the arguments you used, but the general feeling. So it's that kind of balance of, we need to make sure that we're saying the right things, but also in the right way. Mm -hmm. Because that feeling and what people are left with will probably be one of the most important things that they then take with them when they're thinking or processing or mulling it all over. So yes, it's, um, there's a few aspects to think about. And, and, and I think it, it can sound complicated, but for the most part, this is just how most of us interact. We are nice, we do listen, hopefully. We do you know, ask good questions. We do stimulate conversation. We do respect people. We do empathize with people. I think conversations about veganism are actually just about trying to maintain the people that we normally are and not give in to some of that you know, frustration or sadness or upset which cannot boil over, but instead just being the people we are with the people that we, that we you know, have around in our life normally. Can we take that kind of way of conversation, that way of speaking, into these conversations with people who maybe are strangers or who maybe are slightly more antagonistic, but who would still respond to a more calm and effective form of dialogue as well. Yeah, I always find that like people, activists between within themselves, within the activist communities are always saying like, what's the best way to speak to people? And I've always, I've always felt like everyone's individual, like my way is not gonna work for someone else. I, facts and figures have never been my, my go-to. I've always been a very emotional person in terms of like creating an emotion dynamic between two people and I always think that's really important and I think that's something that you talk about loads in your book and at the end of the day whether you remember the most important and scary fact um, that you know about animal agriculture or you make them feel really like kind of like listened to heard to understood because you know I wasn't vegan you weren't vegan <laughs> at some point yeah so you know that that's really really important and I think that's really integral and I like that that you talk about that repetitively throughout your book um, so going on to the book, um, would you like to just summarise what archetypes are? Because we're going to talk about them. But <laughs> yeah, um, the archetypes. So when, when we were, when I was creating the proposal for the book and I'd laid out the kind of outline for what the book would look like, the first section of the book, the first couple of chapters were, were kind of about how to effectively communicate, talking about some of the things that you and I have just gone through um, and also exploring like behavioural drivers. Why do people think the things they do? Why do people believe the things they do? What, what's kind of spurring that on? And then the, the bulk of the book, the next section is, is the argument. So in the book I address as many arguments as I, I possibly could think of that are used against veganism and, and respond to them and, and hopefully provide um, a compelling debunking of those arguments. Um, but rather than just splitting the arguments down to like health, environment and ethics, where there's a lot of crossover and you know, it's kind of a, a very, you know, um, not predictable, but a well-trodden well, well -trodden path of, of looking at the arguments in that way. 
um, myself and, and uh, the publishing team, we thought we'd try something different, which is to split the argument into, into archetypes. Because, you know, people have different personalities, they have different interests, and their personality and, and their um, socialization and, and, and the culture they are around and the people they are around will determine kind of like some of the beliefs they have and then what arguments they'll use. So we kind of were a little bit tongue in cheek. We create these archetypes. So you know, we have the, the well-intentioned leftist, for example. This is someone who makes arguments about veganism being kind of like a white middle class thing that's maybe looking down on people that could be viewed as classist, ableist, um, anti-indigenous. So they're kind of those more left-wing arguments. Um, there's the anti-woke warrior as kind of the counterpoint. You know, vegans are, uh, you know, imposing uh, on you know, their, their way of life on people. They're taking away our freedoms and civil liberties and they want to put laws on, you know, this kind of like um, culture wars right-wing argument that veganism gets, gets dragged into. There's that, there's the pseudoscientist. This is the person who just has the worst science. You know, they've followed the terrible pages on Instagram. They watch YouTubers, there's, there's dodgy podcasts, right? With these experts that spout nonsense. Um, you know, so they, they think that grass-fed beef is gonna save the planet and that if you consume soy, you're gonna get man boobs and feminize yourself. You know, just these classic, you know, completely um, anti-scientific arguments. Um, there's the amateur nutritionist. You know, when, when you go vegan, all of a sudden, everyone becomes an amateur nutritionist, right? You know, my mom, all of a sudden becomes an expert on protein. When did that happen? Did she do a degree when I wasn't looking? I'm not sure, but all of a sudden everyone becomes this, this kind of amateur nutritious. Where are you gonna get your calcium from? What about your iron? What about your B12? Don't you have weak bones and all of this? So kind of exploring both those kind of like uh, stereotypical nutritionist arguments. And then there's others that are like the practicalist. This is the person who has, has very, you know, obvious, you know, justifications. You know, what, what about if, you know, I don't live in an area where there's accessibility? What if um, I'm a low income family and I'm reliant on food banks? You know, just people who have very good questions around the practical issues that can exist for some people. So there's a whole host of different ones. Um, and through them, um, I'm able to address all of the arguments that I've uh, encountered in my time and um, hopefully do so in, a, in it's broken down in, a, in, a, in an engaging way. Yeah, it certainly was. I'm, I was listening to this on my audio book whilst I was going for runs. <laughs> so I was training for a half marathon. I was like, woo. And like, there were so many times throughout that I was like laughing and I was like, that's funny. Oh, good. <laughs> and I was like, I, I loved, um, it's the first audio book I've ever listened to. I'm normally more of a reader. Um, but yeah, it was really, really lovely to listen to it and hear you go through these archetypes and like little funny like quirks here and there. And I was like, oh, this is like, it, in, in the way it was written and the way you read it, obviously, um, made it very nice and easy to digest as well which i think is great because at the end of the day i think a lot of vegans do struggle with um, how to speak to people like whether you're an activist whether you know you're you know a direct action person or if you're just speaking to your mom like yeah. you have to know how to speak to people and that's what this book's basically about right right absolutely i think you hit on a really important point which is by being vegan we end up in these conversations it's it's just just an inevitable consequence of being vegan. As soon as someone finds out you're vegan, you know, and it, it, it's not necessarily a bad faith thing. People just want to know. They want to, you know, well, what do you eat? Or, but hang on a minute, how do you get protein? Or, but what a minute, you know, avocados, aren't they destroying the planet? You know, people naturally have all of these arguments and it's, it's completely understandable that they'd want to, to, to quiz you when, when they meet you. But that means for us vegans, gosh, you know, whether we want to or not, we end up in these conversations. You don't even have to be an activist. It will just, just happen over the family dinner table with your partner, with your children, with your friends, whoever it might be. So I think it is about being prepared, you know, having good responses um, and, and being able to defend yourself and also build up conviction, you know. I think one of the things that vegans can struggle with is when they hear all of these anti-vegan arguments and then the doubt starts to creep in, you know, what if, what if, what if, and if we don't then explore why these arguments aren't good, that, that doubt can really creep in for people. You know, I've met people who used to be vegan and they go, oh yeah, but I just started hearing this stuff online or I started seeing these people saying this and I wasn't sure what's true. And, and it's like, well, that's really sad because people are getting swayed by misinformation. So this is also a book that will build up determination, conviction, and hopefully you'll have a few aha moments, you know, where you, you, maybe you've heard this argument about plant protein being inferior, and you, is it inferior? And then hopefully you, you read the book and you go, aha, now I know that that's not true, and this is why it's not true. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question you posed at all, but... It was more a comment, but okay, it was great. Well, <laughs> it was great. You like, did a great comment back, so that was fab. Um, I'm going to be Piers Morgan right now. Oh, God. Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. That would be horrifying. But, um, I'm going to hack in... my phone or something. <laughs> no, You'll wrong, have to cut that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you do tackle like the Piers Morgan arguments, you know, the, the bees, the avocados, the almonds. Yeah. Um, 
that argument seems to be cropping up everywhere now. Yeah. How, give us a quick summary. How do we answer it? <laughs> well, the bees one is a very interesting argument. It's, it's so deeply hypocritical, isn't it? That um, non-vegans care about animals or don't? I, get, I, so I just get confused, you know? It's like, do you or, I'm just not sure. Um, the, the bees one is, is a fascinating one. Um, a lot of this idea stems from places like America where bees are used quite a lot in the production of certain crops. The most famous one for us vegans is usually almonds. Majority of the world's almonds come from California. Look, let's be honest, the farming of almonds in California isn't, isn't ideal. You know, as, I think as vegans, we, we would agree that let's not use bees in this way when we can avoid doing so. But the, the simple solution for us, and, and kind of one of the things I say very clearly in the, in the book is, well, we don't have to buy almonds from California if you don't want to. You know, if you as a vegan or as a non-vegan are worried about it, then just buy almonds from Europe. Alpro, for example, they source their almonds from Europe, so do Plenish, so do, um, I think that is pronounced Provamel or Prova problem, I think, um, another plant milk brand. So there are ways of avoiding that. But the thing about bees, which is which is really interesting, is firstly, bees are used in, in the production of animal feed. Mm -hmm. So if, let's say you're in the US and you can buy almond milk or cow's milk. I mean, you don't have to. You can buy oat milk. Oats self-pollinate, so take the bees out of the equation. But let's say you only have almond milk or cow's milk and you care about bees. You might think, well, I should choose the cow's milk then. But then alfalfa, which is a primary feed source in, in, in places in the US, well, there's a huge amount of environmental harm related to that, the amount of land that it uses, the amount of water that's used in the production of that. And of course, bees can be used in the, in the, uh, in the pollination of, of, of feed for dairy cows as well. So if you are in a place like the US, choosing almond milk over cow's milk always makes sense anyway, from an ethical, sustainability, water perspective. But especially for us in, in places like Europe, just, just opt for almonds from somewhere else or opt for soil or opt for oat milk. I mean, my goodness, the idea that people shouldn't be vegan because one area of the world doesn't use bees very well. I mean, like, that's what, a, what a completely ridiculous argument. But here's what's really interesting. In, in the UK, there's, there's a, a really um, strong correlation between um, beehives for honey and, or bee production for honey and uh, bees being used for pollination. Now, all the bees used in the US that are used to pollinate plants there are from honey farmers. So what happens is honey farmers get the bees or breed in the bees, buy them in or whatever the process would be for them. And they use the honey to self profit. And then they rent the bees out to certain crop farmers, such as almond farmers. So when you have a reduction in the number of bees being used in, in, in such a country like the UK, what you see is a reduction in bees being used for pollination. And actually what we've seen in the UK is a downward trend in the past several decades or so. So the amount of crop pollination done by um, agricultural bees, honeybees, has declined. And now we use predominantly wild bees and wild pollinators instead for that. So the reason why this system in the US and in other places exists using bees as for crop pollination is because of honey production. And because it's, more, it's just a more profitable thing, an easier, a easier thing because of the system already exists. But if you change the system, crop farmers change. And if we stop eating honey and there's now no honeybees being bred for honey and the honey farmers aren't renting the honeybees to crop producers, what happens? The crop producers change. They just change how they produce the plants, which is exactly what they've done in the UK. So there's this weird thing where vegans get accused of causing harm to bees because of a system that only exists because of non-vegans consuming honey. Take out the honey, take out the honeybees, and almond farmers and other crop farmers that currently use honeybees will just diversify. They'll use wild bees, they'll, they'll, they'll find different forms of crop pollination which are more sustainable and beneficial. So the, the argument isn't to abuse more animals. The argument is to actually abuse less animals by not consuming honey, and then we'll change the system, because that's already happened here. So um, it's annoying, really annoying, really, really annoying when, when we have these arguments used, which when you look at the research that's been done, it just doesn't, just doesn't hold up, you know? I was going to say that, like, I feel like most people don't know. <laughs> they don't know even why they're saying avocados, almonds, um, like the bees, it, it, as an argument. They've just heard it. And I think that's a big thing about animal agriculture. Um, it's almost like Chinese whispers, like that just spreads as like a massive rumor. Um, and there are so many parts of this, like humane washing and everything. Um, and I wondered if, if that's something you came across in terms of your research for the book, or I mean, not over your nine years, like something that you found is really, really like important when you talk to an individual and you're like, this person just doesn't know. And like, you know, this is like why I do outreach. Yeah. Yes. And I think you've hit the nail on the head. People have arguments, but they don't necessarily understand their own arguments. You see it with, with politics as well, where people will say something that they've heard or they've read in the Daily Mail or they've seen on GB News, but they won't necessarily know what they, what they, what they mean. 
So well, that's why I think asking questions is good. If someone was to say, you know, for example, um, but hang on a minute, um, what happens to bees for almonds is really bad. Ask them, tell me what happens, you know, ask them. Ask, and I think that's a really powerful way of trying to just show to them that maybe they are just regurgitating arguments they've heard without necessarily understanding, you know, what, what, what the argument itself is. Because I think there is a lot of, um, a lot of misconceptions about things from people who, as you've said, have seen the headline, have read an article that clearly has a lot of bias that's not nuanced, um, and then they've taken that as gospel and are now using that as their justification without actually understanding it. I come, I come across it all the time. My, 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 my life is spent, it seems, having people say things to me, and I'm, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. You know, and you don't always get to tell people that because it's a lot of it's online, but it happens regularly, and I think that that speaks to the power of misinformation and how pernicious it is and how it spreads um, and how we as a species often lack critical thinking. It's not really, I mean, it is a skill that we learn in school. I mean, so we're taught to analyze things and, and reflect on things, but I think critical thinking is one of the most important skills that we need as humans. And yet it's one of those things that's not really, you know, touched upon anywhere near as much when we're, when we're, in, we're in schools and learning. So I think, you know, learning about critical thinking, learning why we should scrutinize evidence, learning how to scrutinize evidence. Another thing is people aren't scientifically literate and that's not their fault. I mean, goodness, if you open up a science paper, right? That's a peer peer reviewed piece of piece of research. The first thing you do is you look at it and you go, "What the hell are they talking about? What are these acronyms they're using? What does this mean?" You look at these tables and you're like, "I don't. What am I looking at?" It's it's hard because this is produced by experts who, who are scientific experts who have their terms and who have their their methodology. And to the average person who's not a climate scientist or not a food scientist or whatever, and they want to do some digging, it's going to be really overwhelming and hard. And that's not the fault of people. It's just you know, it's we're not we, we're not taught scientific literacy or media literacy or how to be critical in, in important ways, I don't think anywhere near as much as we should be. So all of this is to say, I suppose that, yeah, I do encounter it, but I try to detach the, the, the person who's given me the argument with the reality of why they think it. You know, if someone comes up to me and says, animals are treated really well in the UK, my first, my first thought could be to say, how can you say that? Like, what are you thinking? Blah, 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 that's clearly not true. Or my, my actual thought process would be, I understand why they think that. I mean, go into a supermarket, turn on the TV, watch a red tractor advert, talk to a farmer, and they will tell you the same thing, that in the UK, we have the best animal welfare standards in the world. And look, yeah, maybe in the US, maybe in Russia, maybe in China, they do terrible things to animals, but not here, not, not in this, this green and pleasant land where we live. And so am I then surprised that people think that these welfare standards mean anything, that laws actually protect animals, that animals are treated well? No, I totally, totally, 100% understand why someone thinks that. It's my job to try and unravel that so they can start to see the error um, in that belief. So I think it's about detaching the person from the argument and understanding how arguments are shaped, because through understanding how arguments are shaped, we as advocates can more effectively break those arguments down and reveal to that person why they're wrong. Mm. Yeah, I mean... Society, I think, is almost like made up of echo chambers, <laughs> and like obviously, if you're little, if, if you're in an animal agriculture echo chamber, you know that that's what you believe, that's what you live and breathe, and also there is a vegan echo chamber as well. Absolutely you know, right. There's, there's always going to be an echo chamber everywhere. So, yeah. you know, it's something. It's something that even I personally have been thinking about more and more because I realised that I kind of got myself into an echo chamber, and I was like, I want to challenge those beliefs. Yeah. And I went to an auction house. I, I started doing. Uh, I worked with a group called Farmers um, Farmers Working Supporting the Vegans or whatever it's called, or Vegans in the for farmers yeah. that way around yeah. <laughs> and I went into auction houses and I spoke to farmers and it was the most like amazing experience because just speaking to these farmers who agree with a lot of what vegans agree um, and you know you find that common ground and you're like actually whoa this is amazing and I know you've done a lot of conversations with farmers I mean you've, you've chatted to so many people what's the most important thing about speaking to a farmer who's like the polar opposite to you apparently well I think I think actually you had a really important point there which is if you speak to a farmer and you and you say to them hey should we have a food system that treats animals with respect and compassion and is sustainable um, th th they'll say yes there's obviously a huge amount of cognitive dissonance there you know there's a huge amount of work that's been done psychologically by them to try and marry that 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 principle with the reality of what they do but i don't think that look look there are farmers undeniably who do terrible things to animals purposefully consciously and deliberately and they are terrible terrible people obviously immoral people but then there are lots of farmers who don't they're raised in those environments and they think that the things that they do to animals which are bad are actually sometimes they they 
dilute themselves into thinking they're beneficial for animals. Now, sometimes you can think, well, maybe they're not being genuine, they're probably being inauthentic, they maybe know that they're kind of stretching the truth, but there's probably some out there that, that do think that tail docking for lambs is essential because of fly strike, who uh, do think that uh, intensive farming, use, the use of um, farrowing crates, for example, is to try and reduce piglet mortality, these arguments that are used. Even though those things are, are not true and are certainly not necessary, I think that there are farmers that, that can convince themselves of this lie because they're raised in that, they have a vested interest in that, they're emotionally biased towards believing it, and their community reinforces that. And I think echo chambers are, are, are great when you're building communities, but if we want to become more rounded individuals and we want to understand other people's opinions, sometimes we've got to break out of that. That doesn't mean we have to go and speak to farmers. You know? It doesn't mean we have to do what maybe you and I have done because of the work that we do. But I think just kind of being aware of the arguments people use, being aware of why they think the things they do can help us bridge those, 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 those gaps, those, those barriers. Um, and I think farmers, whilst they represent everything that I'm trying to stop, they are also a huge part of the solution to the problem. Because if farmers change, if farmer mentalities change, then systems change. And I think, you know, you change the mind of a farmer, that's, that's far more impactful than changing the mind of an everyday consumer, not to devalue the power of doing that. My, my, my work is all about changing consumer minds. But farmers hold a huge, uh, are a huge part of this, this solution in terms of changing what they produce or how they use their land, maybe looking to produce crops or carbon capture, you know, reforesting, whatever, rewilding, whatever it might be. And so I think farmer outreach from vegan organizations can be a really important thing of bridging that and kind of saying, hey, this isn't fundamentally, or it doesn't have to be us versus them. We don't have to be at loggerheads with farmers. We can, we can absolutely disagree with them and should, and should hold them accountable and should express disdain at the things that they do, but also recognize why farmers farm, how they end up in that, what that process is like, and the power of community for them. Because we are in our echo chambers, so are they. So, you know, I had a debate last week with um, an agricultural student on the Jeremy Vine show. And I spoke a little bit about it at the event you and I did yesterday. But once that conversation had ended, I felt really upset and frustrated. But what I had to tell myself is this is an agricultural student mm -hmm. who was raised in a farming background. The things he believes, he thinks are true. He's not going on the radio and thinking to himself, ha ha, I'm lying to the British public, look at me. He thinks this is, this is true. He, you know, when he says that plant, a plant-based diet will cause famine, which is an argument he used, he's not saying that thinking, gosh, wow, I'm really pulling a fast one here. He, he's saying it because that's what he's been told by his family, by his parents, his grandparents, and maybe sadly even by the school that he's in, the agricultural college, which is you know, a real travesty. So uh, um, do I resent this, this, this student? Do I hate this student? No, because whilst I totally disagree with him, whilst he frustrates me greatly, I have to think, okay, but why does he think this? How has he come to this? And if I'm ever to change his mind, which obviously I won't over a radio phone and interview, but if we were ever to meet and I was to change his mind, the first thing I'd have to do is understand why he thinks that the way he does. And then I could challenge him from that and hopefully start to show to him that his arguments are completely flawed. Mm -hmm. But I have to at least understand that he believes them. I have to give him that because then I can treat him with the understanding that I need to approach him in a certain way because otherwise he will become more entrenched in his views. Yes, it's, it's, I think it's something that people like struggle with in, in, in anything, like if, you know, meeting someone who's completely opposite to you, that is, it's, it challenges you and it challenges your view in any way. But I think, you know, we're, we're learning beings we should be consistently learning and challenging ourselves and I think it's really important to do that and put yourself in situations where you are challenged yeah. um, and you know speaking to farmers maybe that's something that me and you want to do <laughs> yeah. and maybe that's something that someone else doesn't want to do um, w like you know a lot of people and we talked about this again yesterday so it's going to be like a little bit of summarizing for me and you again but um, a lot of people really do struggle with talking to not strangers um, strangers are sort of easy sometimes, but talking to their friends and family, yeah. um, you know, it's definitely something I know you've struggled with, I know I've struggled with, we've, I've, everyone's struggled with. Um, what would your top, top tips be for that? Um, I think um, validate our experience. There's a, there's a very understandable reason why we would struggle with family and friends, that these are the most emotionally heightened conversations for us. These are the people who we care about the most. These are the people who we probably most ardently wish were vegan. You know, I mean, how lovely would it be if we could have Christmas as, as a vegan family, you know? How wonderful would it be if we could have everyone around for a meal and not have to worry about a conversation or a debate or an argument or whatever. You know, we would love that. And I think that one of the things that can be hard for vegans is when you go vegan, you can, it doesn't happen for everyone. And, you know, I hope it doesn't happen for, for most, but you can 
find yourself having a sense of separation from these people? How do I go home and put a smiling face on while my mother is eating the corpse of a baby animal, right? That kind of view, which isn't helpful necessarily, but undeniably goes through our heads. In the first book, I reference um, um, an event. It was my grandparents' um, 60th wedding anniversary. I believe it was 60. Um, and I was invited to go for a meal to celebrate, I mean, a lovely thing to celebrate, you know, love for all of these years, you know, a wedding and, you know, all these years ago, and now they're still together. It's such a beautiful thing. And yet I got a menu sent in the post for the, for the meal and they kind of sent both menus so I could see what the non-vegan menu was. And it was, you know, animal products and animal products and animal products, you know, start to main dessert, just death, death, death. And uh, the vegan one, and the vegan one, the dessert was a fruit salad. So that kind of set the scene for me about what I should expect. And I just had this really um, challenging situation where I, it was kind of early, earlier on into my vegan journey, or at least it was only a few years into it compared to where I am now. And I didn't know what the ethically right thing to do was. Do I go to this meal knowing that my food is going to be inadequate for me, you know, let alone for people aren't vegan, they're going to look at me and go, my goodness, this vegan guy's really depriving himself, but not, they know who I am, not just a vegan guy, but, you know, oh, my son or my grandson or my, you know, my nephew or whoever, you know, whoever was looking at me in that moment would go, wow, this vegan thing is it really is deprivation. So the food itself is kind of making veganism look bad. And then I'm going to be there surrounded by people who I, who I care about and this this celebration of love and we're celebrating with death and harm. And I made the decision that I would go for the day to celebrate, but when the meal was happening, I would, I, would, I would step out and then come back. It was kind of like a form of protest in a way, even if that maybe feels a little bit extreme to say. Um, and at the time and afterwards, I really didn't know if I'd made the right decision. Did I seem dogmatic? Did I seem extreme? Did I seem, did I seem uncaring, unkind, and loving? Did I disappoint my grandparents? Did I make them sad on their special day? Did I make it about me when it should have been about them? This guilt, this shame, this, did I do the right thing, but then morally was it the right thing, but then morally was it not the right thing? And I don't know, I, I, even now, I, I, I don't know. I think maybe I'd do things differently now. So there's just a lot of emotion involved in it and how, how you traverse that emotion is hard. And I think because the stakes are higher, there is more likely, it's more likely there's gonna be an argument. And also with family and friends, especially family, you, you know you can have an argument and still love one another. You know, it's an unconditional love. So even if you have a big argument, the chances are, unless it goes really, really, really wrong, the chances are you're still gonna love one another. And you know, once you've calmed down, you'll be hugging and, 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 and be a family again. So in a sense, you have a little bit more of a license to let things spiral in a way. You don't have to hold yourself as accountable. So I think that can creep in. And also it depends what your family's like. Maybe you have a parent who's a little bit mean. You know, people do have mean parents, as sad as that is. Maybe you have a parent who's a little bit you know, um, uncaring about it. Maybe you have a, a parent who wants to antagonize you or, or a brother or a sister who wants to antagonize you, as sad as that may, that may be. So I think that there's this whole dynamic which is really built upon years, decades, you know, at the ages that, that we are, decades of life where all of these experiences have been shared and you have all of this baggage, emotional baggage, history that's brought into this conversation and it, it, and it goes beyond it, but it goes beyond just the conversation. And I also think that with parents, we as vegans should be somewhat mindful. You know, my mom didn't raise me to be a bad person. You know, she didn't, she didn't think, oh gosh, I'm raising my son to be an animal abuser. That's not what she thought. So if I go vegan, or I did go vegan and I was, you know, I'd been, I'd been alive for two decades at this point. So I turned to my mum and say, for the past two decades, I've been doing something that's immoral. You know, obviously as a, as a child, you don't have much responsibility, but you know, I've been engaging in practices that are, that are immoral. You have made me engage in these practices. I'm not saying that to my mother, but by saying, hey, I'm vegan because what we do to animals is immoral. I'm criticizing her and I'm criticizing her as a parent. Mm -hmm. So am I then surprised that she would be upset? Am I surprised that she would maybe be angry towards me? No, I get it. She's raised me in the way that she thinks is right and by societal standards is right. But for me, realizing what I've now realized, I recognize that this huge piece of the way that I was raised, which was terribly wrong. And I'm trying to change that. And as a, as a, result, as a result, I'm criticizing the way she raised me. I think that's hard for a parent to hear. Even if it's not explicit, that is the insinuation. That's the accusation in many ways. And I think that's hard for a parent to hear. So I can understand why a parent might not react in the way that we as a vegan would want them to. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to say, hey, mom, I've gone vegan. 
and you want her to go, oh, wow, that's amazing. Please tell me all about it. And you go, well, mom, look, what we do to animals is bad. And she goes, yeah, you know what? It is bad. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go vegan. You know, that's the dream. That would be the dream. <laughs> wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? And I, I'm sure it happens with some, but for most it doesn't. And we have to live with that and rationalize it. And I think having empathy towards their experience can help make that a bit easier for us as well. Yeah, I think... Um it's something that I struggle a lot with my parents or my siblings and my family as well. Like, you know, when you're speaking to them and you're like, but you don't understand, like, <laughs> this is so horrible. And um, that frustration and that emotion, because it is such an emotionally charged thing. You're talking about, you know, slaughter and abuse and exploitation. Like, you know, the animal agriculture industry, not just animal agriculture, like, whatever goes on to animals, the fashion industry, all these other, expo like, exploitation issues. Um, they're horrendous and you know that's consistently in your head so when you're when you're speaking up for veganism or like you know wearing a badge you you know you're you're already thinking about it and i think it's really really difficult to have those conversations without charging them with extra emotion yeah um it's definitely something i find um the meal thing is something that i find is discussed a lot when we get close to christmas as well yeah whether you should have like you know christmas dinner with your family with, with whether you shouldn't and i've heard pros and cons for both yeah like you know I, I personally don't but i do also sometimes feel like i'm missing out yeah um so you've got to like balance that out and see what works for you and it's, it's it's such a tricky situation like dealing with family and friends um so i wanted to move on to quickly talk about your other stuff you know you do lots of other stuff you've got the surge sanctuary you're a co-founder of that that's right um i wondered if you could tell us what the surge sanctuary is <laughs> yeah i mean the surge sanctuary um it's kind of what it says on the tin. It's a, a sanctuary for, for rescued animals. So we have um, an area of land um, in the Midlands and it's now home to pigs, cows, chickens, flock of sheep, um, and a whole host of, of uh, rabbits as well. A whole host of animals who've been rescued from different situations of farming, abuse, neglect. Um, and I, for me, when I first went vegan sanctuaries were a really important part of, of um, solidifying my views and also meeting animals and I think that the power of a sanctuary is it allows an animal to express their story their individuality we don't we don't think of non-human animals as individuals we think of sheep being sheep chickens being chickens this, this collective term you know we have dogs and cats in our homes and we or hamsters they have names they have personalities and we recognize that we don't think all dogs are the same but we kind of think all oh, pigs well pigs are dirty even though they're actually very clean animals you know the, the reason they roll in mud is because they don't sweat it's a way of cooling themselves down in hot weather and and contrary to, to popular belief they don't roll around in in their own muck it's just this 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 impression that we have of them to devalue them even even further to make what we do to them seem even more okay even though it's not so i think sanctuaries are such an important thing because they allow animals to um have a life of freedom and happiness, the most important part of it. But it also gives us as humans the opportunity to tell their story, to allow people to identify with individual animals. We have Eric the sheep, who is, who's been a mainstay there, uh, one, of the, one of the OGs. You know, this, this, just this wonderful sheep, Eric, who is just like no other sheep you'll meet. He's grumpy at times and likes his privacy, but then he's just so curious and so playful and so kind, you know, nurturing to the, the lambs who we rescue and, and, and you know, like a, a father figure at times to them, you know, without, without even, you know, just, just such a lovely animal. We have pigs like Nigel, just this, just, he was this tiny little pig who had, who had been bought to be um, a tiny pig, even though no such, no such thing exists. A micro pig, <laughs> exactly this, this myth. Um, and quickly the people who bought him realized, oh, this isn't, this isn't what we signed up for. So we were able to take him and he was only so small. He's this huge pig now, but so, so charismatic, so kind, so, um, so friendly, follows people around, makes grunts and, you know, just inquisitive you know just you get to meet animals and you get to see them in this way like we do dogs and cats it's not a revelation to go hey sheep can be different and pigs can be different but we don't normally think about it like that um and so a sanctuary for me when i was in that vegan journey was was a really big part of that and actually right at the end of, the, of my first book i i talk about visiting a sanctuary a uh, friend animal sanctuary um in kent um and this pig walking up to me i'd never seen never in interacted with, with a pig before and I was amazed by the bristles, the hairs that they have. I didn't think about the pigs being with bristles and hairs and um, the pig had no tail because the tail had been docked and it, it made it all real to me, this process. And I remember watching this pig walking off and their hoofs, which look a little bit like elegant high heels, the way they walk. I just remember looking at them and going, what, what a pig? When, you know, like, well, how did I not think about pigs like this before? Um, 
And that is why sanctuary, that's why I think sanctuaries are really important as well. It gives us a chance to think about animals as individuals, tell their stories and, and gives people a chance to, to, meet, to meet them in a way that we never get to meet pigs and cows and, and sheep and such. Yeah, I always find that like, you've got the vigils, so you've got like, you know, going to slaughterhouse gates and seeing like, what's about to happen to those animals and imagining it and it's horrendous. And then you've got the other side of it. You've got these slaughterhouses where it's like the lucky few that have, you know, get to live those lives of freedom. And I think it's really interesting that we hide the slaughterhouse. Like you never see that on the news. You never see like these animals like photographed, unless it's like in the vegan movement, obviously. Um, and then, but then you get stories like Matilda. Right. Who, you know, popped out into the surge and she became a sensation. So, you know, tell me about Matilda. Yeah. I don't know if anyone knows. Well, Matilda's yeah. a fascinating story that speaks to, I think, a few really important things. The only time that slaughterhouses normally make the news is when an animal's escaped from one. It happens quite a lot in the US, it happens here in the UK, where if a cow escapes or an animal escapes, that normally ends up on the news. Sadly, they normally ever get shot or they get taken back, but sometimes they, they do end up in sanctuaries. And what's really fascinating about those stories is when an animal escapes, everyone roots for the animal. Everyone roots for the animal. Um, they want them to live. You know, there was a, a cow who was uh, named Daisy by people online who had escaped from, I believe, a slaughterhouse in Carlisle. And the people online were saying, let, let, let Daisy live, like save Daisy. These are meat eaters. So I think when we encounter animals who have sh shown autonomy, or who show personality, show individuality, we naturally then feel bad about them being killed. We don't want them to die. I think what's tragic about that is we think that those animals are different. Or the cow that escapes can't be like the other cows because she escaped, so she must have a, something different about her. That's why she's valuable, even without realizing that all the other cows who have been killed, uh, you know, also possess the same moral worth. It's just, we've had our attention drawn to this one cow. Mm. So I think it's really fascinating how when we see animals in distress, or when we are notified of an animal who's done something remarkable, like escape from a slaughterhouse, as, as harrowing as that, that is for them, um, our natural urge is to help them, not, not, to, not to round them up and kill them. We're not, we're not you know, finding you know, these stories uh, sad because we're, we're annoyed the cow is, hasn't been slaughtered for, for meat yet. We, we want them to live. Now, Matilda is a fascinating story because she was being raised on what is considered a high welfare farm. This wasn't an intensive pig farm. She didn't escape from a, from a gestation crate or a farrowing crate. Um, she was being raised on, on what is considered a high welfare farm with, with outdoor farrowing. Well, what she, she was at the end of her pregnancy and she escaped from the farm. So she broke out through the fence and escaped from the farm. And she was spotted in woods nearby and she gave birth to all her piglets in the woods. So she must have been right about to give birth and she fled to give birth in, in safety away from the farm in these woods. And I think when you, when you think about animals escaping, the first thing to recognize is that, that they're escaping from something and they've decided not to go back. You know, this isn't an animal who's wandered out and then that comes back. This is an animal who, who's, who's made a break for it, which no other animal has been able to do. But have seen an opportunity and gone for it. This is a deliberate escape and they've not gone back. You know, they've not decided to try and go back. And this is a deliberate escaped attempt, which, the, which, which Matilda succeeded in doing. And the fact that she did it right before she gave birth, um, I think that, that speaks to something motherly. Mm -hmm. This, this, this motherly desire to, to care for her piglets. Maybe she'd given birth on the farm before and had seen her piglets being taken away. Maybe she'd seen it happen to one of the other mothers, or maybe she just had a general feeling that something was bad, you know, that, that this wasn't a place for her babies to be born. So she, she made a break for it. Um, anyway, long story short, it, it gained the, the, the attention of the media, the, the Matilda, the pig who escaped and who gave birth in, in, in the woods. And I think people loved that story, um, you know, me teacher or not, there was something really um, almost fairy tale like it was almost like a children's story. Mm -hmm. This this mother pig who's escaped and is no, who gave birth in these woods and was found one day by um, a dog walker in, in, in these woods just had been suckled by a baby. So there was something there was something that appealed to this kind of almost fairy tale nature quality of it, this children's stories. Um, and anyway, yeah, we were with the help of another sanctuary called Brinsley, um, Matilda and her piglets came to search sanctuary. Now these, these, these are not piglets anymore. These are, these are, these are pigs. Mm -hmm. So we had this family. And that's another thing that's really rare. Obviously families don't get to stay together in, in most, most animal farms. They're separated at birth, you know, um, many of them are slaughtered when they're children, when they're, when they're babies. So families are torn apart all the time in, in animal farming. And it's so rare for a, a family of 
conventionally farmed animals to, to be together. Um, and that's the bittersweet thing about sanctuaries is you have these, these wonderful stories of animals who have escaped, families together, but that's one in, a, one in what, 10 billion? You know, I mean, like what are the, the chances of a whole family of pigs staying together, it's you know, unheard of, it, you know, it's just not, not a thing because that, that never usually would happen. So you have this bittersweet moment where you're in a sanctuary or when you're thinking about these animals and, and you go, wow, how lovely. And then you realize, oh, that there's a reason why this place exists. There's a reason why she escaped. There's a reason why she fled. There's a reason why this is a story at all. And it's because actually this is, this is awful. Mm. So yeah, I always have these moments where I'm wandering around and you'll see a pig and then, oh, that's lovely. And then you'll see they have no tail. Or you see a chicken and then you see they have no beak. You see a turkey and you see again that they've been mutilated. And then, then you realize, oh, hang on a minute, you know, they were rescued from somewhere and they were one of the exceptionally, exceptionally lucky ones. And the word, even the word lucky is almost offensive to use because no, they're not lucky. You know, they're not lucky. This, this, it's like, you know, being lucky would be being someone who wasn't born into, into that scenario, wasn't born into an oppression in that sense, you know, that would, that would be lucky, but to be born into it and to be rescued isn't luck. It's, it's just a travesty that there was even an environment someone needed to be rescued from in the first place. So it's a bittersweet thing, I suppose, in, in that sense. Um, and it's, you know, it's hard for people. I mean, I, I don't live on the sanctuary. I don't, I don't spend my days there, but it's hard for these the people who do, the volunteers, the people who live there, the, the people who run it, and the people who run sanctuaries, the sacrifice they make, the, the, the desire to just spend their days helping animals I, I, is, is a remarkably noble and uh, in, incredible thing that people do. Uh, I have only respect for people who do that. And it's hard because they have to deal with animals who are dying. They have to deal with grief and loss. On, on, you know, you have 150 animals in a sanctuary. Those animals will die. You have to say no to animals. And, and, and imagine, you know, you have a sanctuary, it's at full capacity. You have to say no. I mean, th this is the, 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 the challenges that people face when they run these places. You know, there's the, the, you know we see online the happy animals and the, the wonderful experiences and the happy music of them frolicking on the, the pastures, the, you know, whatever. And that's lovely. And there's this other side to it, which is dealing with the reality, having to go to these places to rescue them, finding them and, and paying for veterinary bills and, and nurturing them back to health. And then sometimes they don't make it. And then you have to grieve or the loss of that. There's, there's so much about it, which I think is so remarkable and so challenging for the people who are there every single day. Um, so, yeah. 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 I um I visited Search about last uh, last year maybe like a year or a half ago maybe, and I think I was lucky to meet Derek. Derek. Yeah. yeah of course. Um, I don't know if you want to kind of like tell us who Derek is and what his story was. Yeah. So Derek was a, a lamb who we um, rescued, and he had become paralysed. Um, his back legs. Um, he had um, had his tail docked, and, and during the process, um, the farmer and basically. Um, caused a, an infection to um, occur, which, which caused him to become paralyzed. So he, he wasn't born, he, he, he was paralyzed because of this, this mutilation gone, gone wrong, which is a phrase which, which is weird to say in itself because there's no sh mutilation gone, gone good is, is, is an uncomfortable phrase, isn't it? But a mutilation that had gone wrong in, in, beyond the, the, the realms of just the, the mutilation itself. And as a consequence, he lost the use of his back legs and then had infections in his body you know, we would treat him with antibiotics um, and then he would have moments of recovery and then he would, he would relapse again. Um, and we had this, um, this sort of very kindly sort of built this, um, almost like a wheelchair for him so he could run around and he could drag himself around. And it, the whole point was he was supposed to help him build up strength. We'd been, we'd been told that it wasn't that he completely lost the use of his back legs. He could still move them a little bit, but he had no strength. Mm -hmm. So that we were trying to build up that kind of lower spinal strength and, and his leg strength and anyway. It was, you know, the, the workers and volunteers of the sanctuary, days, weeks, just day in, day out, doing this, um, you know, physiotherapy on him and treating him and taking him to the vets. And sadly, uh, um, it got to the point where nothing was working and he was, he just ended up suffering. So it was decided that the, the, the most humane thing was to euthanize him to, because it was an unwinnable battle that had been caused by this mutilation that need never have occurred. You know, this was a healthy lamb who could have had a happy long life and ended up with actually a very sad life and um, ultimately was, was, was euthanized. So there are all of these sad stories that emerge of animals who were who rescued and, and don't make it and who 
have their quality of life compromised severely because of negligence and abuse and, and even these standard practices when they, when they don't go away the way that we're always told that they do because they're high welfare and such. And I think Derek is a, an interesting story because it shows how these mutilations, it's not just, ah, oh, we're removing their tail. Mm -hmm. you know, this is a part of someone's body. You're tying a rubber ring around it to stop the blood flow so it, it rots and falls off. And we do this to their genitals and their tails sorry you want to you want to tell me that we care about animals and we love animals and you're rotting parts of their body parts to make them fall off i'm sorry i just i can't square that you know put that square into the circle hall it just doesn't make any sense um but i think derek speaks to that because you know high welfare so well how, how has this happened and actually land mortality rates are extremely high in the uk because of the cold weather and because of, and because of the things that we do to them um yeah. Yeah. On to like a happier story, because Derek's obviously, even though he had a like, you know, as best a life, I guess, that he could have had in the time that he was with you guys, I said, you have a uh, very old, you have old cows. Yeah. Which is incredibly rare. Like, you know, in the dairy industry, you'd be lucky to make it to six years. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. So uh, you have like this amazing luxury of seeing an, a cow or, or any animal, to be fair. Um, that would have, like, you know, pigs don't make it past six months normally. So, like, it's in incredible, like, an honour to, like, have that and be part of that story and those journeys. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, you've, like, had 20-year-old 20, 20 cows That's and right. stuff like that. You've, like, amazing cows there. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's funny. As you say, it's, it's totally not normal for cows to live this long. The reason why is there was this woman who'd had this farm and she had this, this group of cows that she cared about and she, she didn't send them to slaughter. Um, and then she ran into financial problems, if, if, if my memory serves me correctly. And anyway, these, these cows ended up um, in, she, she had good intentions at the, at the beginning, but they ended up in huge amounts of muck, the mm. uh, feces and mud that had been kept in this barn, like feet high. So they had terrible problems with their legs. And anyway, we, we managed to persuade her to, to relinquish them so that they could be taken to the sanctuary. Um, but it's, it is amazing to have these old cows. One of them just sadly died. Um, but you don't think about cows going gray, but gray hair, you know? Even, even and I know arthritis is not a nice thing, but this is something about an animal getting old and even, you know, arthritis is not nice, but arthritis because of old age, you know, you just go, wow, right? That, this is something not nice about having that as a, an ailment, but the fact that they live this long life and they, almost human, right? Mm. Arthritis as an old lady, because that's what these, these cows are just old ladies. Um, and it's lovely, it's nice to be able to have that. And they're, they're very slow, it takes them a little while to get up. I think of my grandma get up and a hip <laughs> cracking, that's just what they're like. They take, a, they take a bit longer to get up. And there's these um, bulls, they're a bit more boisterous, you know, they're younger, they're like a couple of years old, mm. Rue and Paul, exactly. Um, and they'll, they, you know, they're much more playful, you know, and they'll bounce around them. And you've got these old ladies like, oh gosh, these, these young <laughs> boys again. Exactly. And they're like slowly getting up and slowly, you know, ruminating and munching away. And um, it's just something really nice and peaceful about them. They're, I mean, cows are, um, they're so big, but they're so gentle. I mean, it's, it's sad because that's one of the reasons we exploit them is because they're so docile and gentle. But, you know, you can sit in a field. It's lovely on a summer's day to sit in a field and have these old ladies around you and they're just munching away, but very quiet, so quiet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll get up and you don't even hear them and they'll walk about, they're so quiet. And you can just sit in, 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 a, in a nice field, you've got the insects buzzing around you and these old ladies that are just chewing away. I think it's, it's quite one of the most peaceful things. Yeah, it's such an honor to like experience that, it's great. Um, there's so many negatives to like having your eyes open to the veganism, to, to, to um, the animal agriculture industry and seeing the reality. How do you cope with that? How do you continue being effective and healthy as an individual, knowing all of that and knowing that it's going on right now? Well, I think uh, for anyone doing any line of work, you need separation from that work, even just a, you know, a, a quote unquote regular job. You, you need time away from the office, you need time away to, to unwind. And, and I think it's really important that we as vegans have hobbies, passions, loves outside of, outside of this, you know. Um, I love movies, I love cinema, you know, I, that's what I studied, it's what I, I, I grew up loving it. So making time to watch films, mm -hmm. making time to listen to music, I mean, it, it sounds so simple, but the last thing you want to do is get so absorbed in something that you never have it off. You know, you don't want to go to bed thinking about this. You don't want to wake up thinking about this. You don't want to go on your phone. You know, like follow vegan accounts, but also don't follow vegan accounts. You know, don't follow stuff if every day you're, you're seeing violent stuff. Maybe have a different Instagram, which is just like videos of, I don't know, 
places you want to visit or, or, or recipe videos, just something that takes you out of that world so that you're not always going, oh, this is depressing, this is depressing, this is sad, this is sad, because it is consuming. Mm -hmm. To put your phone down, you know, whatever. I think, I think having space from things, and that's what I find useful. I, I didn't have any boundaries for, for a, a long period of time when I was started this. It was just work, 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 work. Um, and the work I used to do was a lot more like going to slaughterhouses, going to farms. It was, it was viscerally um, more, more challenging at times as well. But now I found a little bit of a healthier balance. My, my work is diversified so I can write a book, you know, mm -hmm. or I can make a YouTube video, or I can go and do some public speaking. I have a lot of autonomy and that's a real privilege to have autonomy in your work. I don't take that for granted, but it means that I can kind of have space to do different things. And, and it also means that I can kind of create some time for myself to go, look, I'm want to go see a film. I don't want to think about veganism and that's fine. Mm -hmm. I used to have a lot of shame and guilt around it. Um, oh, you want to hang out with someone who's not vegan? Well, what about the animals? Just a really a toxic way of viewing things. It's this binary, this, um, you know, mentality of just like, you can't fraternize with the enemy. And it's just not true. You know, I have friends who aren't vegan, you know, we hang out. We don't often talk about veganism, or, you know, and when I say I have friends who are vegan, they're not, they're, they're very supportive of veganism. You know, they're not challenging me. You no, know, yeah. they go to vegan restaurants, they cook vegan food, you know, they're just not necessarily as fully aligned with it as I am, you know. But at the same time, that doesn't mean we can't share other hobbies and passions. I think that's important. You know, it's not that we have to not have vegan friends and not see vegan family. People see, see family who aren't vegan. I, I disagree. I think sometimes it's good for us to, to do that because we should still have relationships. We shouldn't, spoil those relationships necessarily unless unless of course you feel that's the most um best thing for you to do if you've got a particularly toxic family or friendship group of course um so making time for other things and also um really really trying to separate people from their actions in this in this sense in this in this instance i, I can't i can't walk around and, I, and I've had moments, and sometimes it happens, but I can't go out on the street, walk around and see a KFC and look at everyone in there and think, look at you all, oh, you're horrible. I can't do that, you know? I can't go into a supermarket and see people down the meat aisle. I, and I can't do that and think, look at these people, this is disgusting, look at these dead animals, this is awful. It, it happens, but I can't live my life with that feeling. Mm -hmm. So you have to find some detachment from that. You have to have, I suppose it is a sense of emotional maturity to get distance. Mm -hmm. So can I separate my thoughts from my feelings? Can I get a bit of objectivity here? Can I see people not just purely through their actions they partake in, but as, as a product of the world that they live in and feel more empathy and understanding towards them as a consequence? And the longer I've been vegan, the easier that's been. When I first started out, I was a lot more angry. I was a lot more judgmental. I was a lot more accusational. I was a lot less sympathetic. And my mental health and my advocacy suffered as a consequence of that. And I think maturing, becoming more nuanced, becoming more understanding has made me a better advocate, hopefully. I mean, that's not necessary for me to say, but I think so. And also as a consequence has made it easier for me to exist in this world, which philosophically makes no sense to me, really. Very confusing place at times. So I think that emotional space is important. I think, and just, just making time for other things. I'm lucky. I've, I've, my wife is incredibly important to me. We're both vegan together, so we always have that. My friends, you know, close friends. I, I think having a good supportive bubble helps as well. And that, you know, it's, well, community's essential, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. I think a lot of vegans have gone through that angry. It's like almost like you're like, you know, the five stages of grief yeah, right. <laughs> with veganism sort right. of kind of thing. Like, you know, I think like I definitely was like such, well, I don't know. I was like, maybe not like a really, really angry vegan. But when I started doing activism, I definitely was not understanding. Yeah. The first conversation was uh, two random farmers that I found in Leicester Square. Oh, that was wow. really hilarious. <laughs> but now I would look back at that conversation and I would tackle that so differently yeah. because, you know, I'm, I've been vegan five years, so like looking back, like I'm just like, whoa! I I would have so much more empathy for these people, and rather than thinking of them as animal abusers, which obviously they get labelled as, um, I would have a conversation with them, and that that can extend to your family and friends, like you said, like detaching the individual to their actions yeah. is so important. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that's like something that you learn, <laughs> honestly. And it's something that I talk to like a lot of like activists about. Like they, they like you know talk to me and call me, and they're like, you know, my kids aren't vegan, and it's really frustrating and everything. And I'm just, I'm just like, you know, you know, go for a run. <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but cut them up for adoption. Like, yeah, 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 just get rid of them. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Try again. <laughs> <laughs> Try again. But like, it's lots of stuff like that. Like you know, you've got to find your own coping mechanism, exactly like you said. 
Um, I think I'd just like to finish off with just uh, hopefully a good conversation about you and the future. Like, how do you think we're going to get to a vegan future? Or do you think that's something that we're going to see in our lifetimes? I don't think we'll see it in our lifetimes. Um, but there's this really lovely idea, and, and I have to give it credit to um, Matthew Glover, who um, co-founded Veganuary. He's, he's done a couple of interviews recently that I've seen in The Guardian. And um, he was kind of asked a similar question. And he said that um, it's not a sprint, it's a relay. So he's started the relay, he's carrying the baton. He's going to pass the baton on, but he won't cross the finish line with it. And I thought that was a really lovely way of thinking about that. You know, I don't, I don't think you and I are going to be the ones that cross the finish line, but we can hopefully pass the baton on to allow others to get closer and, and then pass it on themselves. So no, I don't think we'll see it. Um, and also, I think the world is far too complex. We're talking about, um, we're talking about a, a, a huge system that is very complex, that has people from different um, uh, economic um, positions, um, the landscape's different, the ability for, to produce food is different, the resources that people have are different. And I think to create like a standardized, generalized system that everyone is a part of is probably unrealistic and, and maybe a bit naive. So I don't think that, I, I, I don't know if we'll ever have like a vegan world, mm -hmm. but what I do think we'll have is a, 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 a a removal of farming. I think that we will lean into alternative proteins like cell cultured meat, precision fermentation, um, plant-based alternatives, and obviously just plants. I think we'll lean into that. So I don't think that we will have animal farming as a system, but I think there will be pockets of it that probably exist in, in, in rural areas and in maybe uh, certain areas of the world where hopefully infrastructure can, can meet higher income nations, but currently obviously is, is, is not there from a wealth or equality perspective. So it really depends, I suppose, on how we humans progress in terms of how we treat one another and how we create a more equitable planet. Mm -hmm. The more equitable a planet is, the more um, chance that everyone has to, to, to progress in the ways that, that we're talking about. So it really depends on that front. But I think that what we will have is a removal of farming as an industry, animal farming as an industry, um, and probably just more pockets of, of localized systems here and there, and maybe hunting and fishing that occurs in certain areas. Um, but I think that we will, we will do a good job of getting there. And I think um, clothing, I think, will, will be Will, will, will disappear, testing will disappear. So it's, it's all a matter of time. And I think that's what a lot of this is. Uh, it seems a little bit dismissive to say it's a matter of time, but I think with technology and stuff, a lot of it is time. Um, and the way that we use animals for testing will change as we, as we get better forms of uh, technology to change how we test medicines and, and uh, procedures and operations and such. And I think that's a matter of time, especially things like AI and such. Um, I think with food, cell culture meat will be a p big part of that. And I suppose then the question becomes, is it a vegan world if people are eating cell cultured meat? Mm -hmm. I guess it really depends what you mean by a vegan world. Um, if people are eating cell cultured meat because it's available, it's cheaper and it becomes normal. But then, you know, are they, what's the motivation, man? It's, it sounds weird, maybe I'm not explaining myself so well, but if someone goes into a supermarket and they have chicken from cell culturing or chicken from a slaughtered animal, and they pick up this, the chicken from cell culturing because it's cheaper, let's mm -hmm. say, which let's hope that that's the choice that they have at some point soon, is that a vegan decision? Probably not, but the consequence of it is what vegans want. So is it a vegan world if we're not harming animals and the reason we're not is because we've got cell cultured meat? And if we didn't have cell cultured meat, maybe we'd still be harming animals. I don't know, but at least we've got to the conclusion we want. It'll be a kinder world, a hopefully. Kinder world, a kinder world, yeah, a kinder world. I just hope the mentalities change, you know, but um, that's, I guess that's the big piece of the puzzle, isn't it? Yeah. I guess that's what your work is about, though. It's about challenging people around the world because obviously social media is around the world. <laughs> um, so it's about challenging people from different, you know, different backgrounds, different ethnic diversities, different politi like politics views. You know, you've, you've, you are trying to speak to people and just get through to kindness because I do feel like that is at the bottom of every single individual, wherever they are. They try to be kind. Oh well, I'd hope so. Maybe I'm really positive and optimistic about this. You, well, you are certainly optimistic. <laughs> I, well, I think that I don't necessarily know if I agree with the sentiment that we are inherently kind. Um, not, I, 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 maybe I'm just way I'm cynical. <laughs> I, I, but I, I think what we are is, um, uh, I think we're full of potential to become that way. I, I know, and the reason I say that is maybe again, it's somewhat cynical. I think of a lot of our kindness and compassion and stuff can be to do with socialization. You know, obviously throughout history, humans have done terrible things because of what was socialized and normalized, and we still do. Um, 
And then our ability to evolve as a species, I think, comes from our intellect and our cognitive capabilities, and, and then hopefully from, from people challenging us to, to improve. And so I think kindness can be a product of intellect and a product of, of accessibility and opportunity. So I think that I think there's a kind of a, a thing that happens with vegan stuff, for example, where you might stop eating animal products, but you might not have connected with animals until a little bit into that process. And I think maybe the kindness that we feel towards animals isn't always there right at the beginning. I'm speaking from personal opinion, I can't generalize it, but I went vegan more from a logical perspective as well as an emotional one of realizing that animals are sentient beings who deserve moral worth. But I don't think I really connected with animals until I had already been vegan. And I think that was a thing where it kind of gave me space to not feel like I was judging myself. Mm -hmm. So if I cared about animals before in, in the way that I do now, let's say, from a moral perspective, I think that was, I didn't have that space to breathe. But being vegan then kind of gave me an opportunity to then think about animals without feeling hypocritical or judgmental of myself. So it kind of gave me the opportunity to think about this issue even, even further. So I think that kindness and compassion can stem from the opportunity to not be involved in something and as a consequence of that, have more time for reflection in a non-judgmental way towards ourselves. So I think kindness can be taught. Learn, is, I think kindness can be a learned behavior in that sense. And veganism can be a part of that education, hopefully. Nice, nice, I like it. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much for coming and talking to me and coming to Bristol. I know you've got uh, another book uh, event tonight, yes. um, although this will be coming out after the book event. <laughs> but um, you'll be in Bristol, Waterstones as well doing that. So if you want to buy Ed's book, you can buy it from Waterstones. He's got two books out, The Vegan Propaganda, This is Vegan Propaganda, and the second one, which is How to Argue with Meat Eater and Win Every Time. Um, Ed, would you like to give us a little bit of a where they can watch you using your stuff and everything? Yes, um, YouTube and Instagram mainly. Um, if you're on TikTok, I am on TikTok, although I'm not an avid TikTok user. <laughs> I upload and then leave the platform as quickly as I can. Um, but TikTok and Facebook as well, if you're still on Facebook. Um, and books are available, uh, Waterstones. Um, it, also, if you have an independent bookstore close to you, ask them, they'll stock it, they'll buy it in for you, and then you can purchase it from them as well. And obviously places like, um, yeah, bookstores and, and such online, so yeah. Oh, super exciting. Well, thank you so much for again, for coming here and chatting to me. It's been really, really exciting and interesting to talk to you. And hopefully enjoy your rest of Bristol stay. Ah, well, thank you for having me on and it's been nice chatting with you. Yeah.